Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 109. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we have Kickstarter previews of Lots and Calico. We've got a recent play of Slide Quest, which we're putting on tap. We each bring a six-pack of sessionable games that you can play under 30 minutes. We talk about some diversity benchmarking in craft beer. And in our final round, we talk about board game burnout. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. You've seen the future and it works today. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. Mm, In small amounts to last longer. Yeah, that's probably a good call for this episode. I think you've you've hit the nail right on the head. Uh, We are talking about sessionable games, which we have defined as games you can play in under 30 minutes. And that is from uh, box off to scoring, I think is what we defined it as. Yeah, well, without a teach. Mm -hmm. Without a teach. We weren't including a teach in this because, obviously, if you have people who aren't paying attention or somebody needs to go use the restroom (laughs) or whatever, some people are just bad at teaching or Mm -hmm. learning, that can be a half-hour experience in and of itself. But if you've got the folks to play it from start to finish of the game, not clean up because clean up is another thing that can take forever depending on who's (laughs) trying to, air quotes, help. Helping putting things away so yeah that that, we have some good picks there are a couple of caveats that we'll talk about later at least on my list Mm -hmm. okay and also with that i'm talking about board game burnout in the final round which is definitely where you want to have uh small amounts to last longer i guess is kind of a tie-in there is that a tie-in at all yeah if you don't play games which take small amounts you can end up with burnout well there you go and you do want small amounts of burnout because burnout is bad small amounts of burnout just little bursts of burning here and there no no you go to the doctor for that very bad yes (laughs) well hey everybody thank you so much for tuning in to this particular episode of draft mechanic and any other ones you've listened to before this we've uh, also appreciated those listens as well if you're looking for us on the internet you can find us at draftmechanic.net or on your favorite social media as long as those favorite social medias are facebook twitter and instagram because we are at draft mechanic on those locations we also have a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up for this episode, as there is for every episode. So if we're talking about something and you're like, hey, I've got opinions on that, that is a place to share them. Get up in that guild. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we do twice monthly board game meetups. The first one is going to be on the first Thursday of every month. That's going to be at Good Road Cider Works. And if you're listening to this when it came out, we just had that one. Yay. The next one will be on the third Tuesday of every month. That is going to be at Salud Cerveceria in the Nodon neighborhood, and our next one coming up is on September 17th. Mm-hmm. We would love to see you there. Salud has amazing food. It gets more amazing every time we go there. Mm. They have great beer upstairs and down, and they have a great space for playing games. Big old tables. Mm-hmm. Tables that I might be able to fit this next game on. So, since our last episode, Stonemaier Games has announced, had the pre-order for, and released Tapestry, their new, or St- Jamie Stegmeyer's new civilization building game. Um, as of recording right now, September 9th. Ours is apparently supposed to be delivered today. We got in early on the pre-order there, so super excited to take a look at Tapestry. But I gotta say, this one apparently sold through 10 or 12,000 copies in the first 36 hours of the pre-order. Uh, pretty much the entire pre-order allotment. He had a 25,000 copy print run of this game, of which he probably, I think, it, you know, not super clear on the amount, but I'm guessing a little more than half going to direct retailer pre-orders and stuff like that, and then the rest was up in this regular pre-order. What do you think about that, potentially selling 10,000 copies of this game in 36 hours? I mean, it's essentially what Kickstarters do. Yeah. In that case, you don't have to pledge the money until whatever the end of the Kickstarter is, but you still have to pay it right up front when you do the pre-order. and. Mm-hmm. You used to look at all these Kickstarters that before Kickstarter changed their rules were like funded in 12 minutes <laughs> and then they sell a ton of copies in that first day. It's not unheard of. It's just that he's not doing it through Kickstarter. He's doing it himself, which obviously is more financially viable, but there's more strain on the publisher at that point as well. Yeah. Frankly, as long as the games show up and they're good games and they show up in a reasonable amount of time, 
doesn't really matter much to me. Yeah. I feel like he's really cracked the code with how to pre-hype, I guess, quote unquote, a game release or to build up for a game release. You know, we had Yeah, whether you think that's a good thing or not. Yeah, um, four or five weeks of teases and information and pretty much description of the entire game. The, you know, playthroughs went up a few weeks ago and then all of the uh, reviewed content, all the review embargo stuff lifted right at the beginning of the pre-order so people could look at it right then, listen to the reviews and see how people... To, you know, wanted to play it or not, and obviously enough people decided that they wanted it. But I just got to think about selling through potentially ten thousand copies of a almost hundred dollar game in thirty six hours is pretty insane. Yeah, it, I guess it also has the benefit of it skipping over the Kickstarter kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for the the period between the campaign finishing and it actually arriving at you the the lag yeah the lag the excitement the the hype of it just kind of starts to fall off and I know that I have. Any number of Kickstarter games that we, you know, thought we'd be like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, and then we get here, get it finally to the house, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, yeah, I would like to play that, but I'm not as excited about that as I used to be. So I'm really interested to see how the tale on Tapestry Sales goes. Obviously, they're going to be, I mean, it's probably going to sell out of every retailer by the time anybody hears this episode, because that's kind of how this stuff works now. And for better or for worse, Jamie Stegmeier is not going to have an ordinary game release ever again, I'm pretty sure. We shall see what we shall see. Now, this is his design again. Yeah. Wingspan obviously had mammoth sales, but that wasn't his design. Mm -hmm. It did have a really unique theme, though, which, from what I can tell from Tapestry, it's a little bit more in line with what you'd expect of a board game. You got your your castles and your civilization building. (laughs) Not so much your good, good birds eating Mm -hmm. nice little fishes. Good, good birds. Um, But, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what this is. I'm not super in the know about it because you have been in the know, and that is the diversity (laughs) of resources that we do in this house. Yes, I I know about some things. You know about the other things. And if we don't know about those things, we'll find out someday. Okay. (laughs) So, yeah, Uh, hopefully we'll be talking about Tapestry over the next few episodes because I'm sure we're going to be getting that to the table pretty soon. It does look super pretty and have some unique ideas in it that I am excited to try. We'll see it in the upcoming episodes. But as we were just talking about shortly ago, perhaps we'll talk about Kickstarters now, Danielle. I believe you have the common updates that we usually do at this time. I mean, they're pretty spectacular updates. Spectacular updates. They're not necessarily common. Actually, we've got only two of them this episode, which is... One of these is is definitely spectacular, though. Yeah, but we were doing like five to six of them an episode (laughs) there for a minute, so I'm I'm glad to only have two. I'm leaning off a little bit. I'm trying to give you a little less to talk about in this Kickstarter update section for a minute. Fiasco from Bully Pulpit Games completed its campaign with $230,291 of their $10,000 goal with 4,196 backers. Pre-orders are actually going to be available for that soon as well, so if you missed out on the Kickstarter campaign, you still have a chance to get it on. I am kicking myself. It is the kind of thing that I'm pretty sure in the last episode we talked about, like, yeah, I'm probably going to end up backing this even though we got the book just because I want to have that ease of play. So I guess I got to wait for this pre-order to go up. Yeah, and it can go in the pile of small (laughs) RPGs that I have a habit of buying on Kickstarter that we don't actually ever get played, which is a huge bummer. We'll get there. I'm traveling less now. That's fine. Sleeping Gods from Red Raven Games has completed its campaign with $1.14 million of their $50,000 goal with 12,056 backers. They reached 30 different stretch goals, (laughs) including component upgrades, content upgrades, and additional expansion modules, and two new modes of play. Yes. So that's a whole lot more content than they were anticipating, but I have a feeling that that was in the works before they put it up as stretch goals, because... Obviously, Red Raven Games is going to know that they, like Stonemaier, are going to blow a pre-release out of the water. I don't think they quite understood that it would be this level, or maybe they did. I don't know. I'm just I mean, supposing there. but Yeah, maybe they did, but this is just absolutely staggering. I mean, Near and Far did well, but it didn't do anywhere near like this. It didn't break a million dollars, did no, it? No, I don't believe so. Um, but I was interested to see the new modes of play that they added in. One of them is an arcade mode, which we saw in Near and Far, which allowed you to play single session anywhere on any of the story maps without having any of the campaign content. It just basically replaced the story decisions with your standard kind of roll and resolve sit- situations like that. And I'm really interested to see how that works in Sleeping Gods, which is a super wide open ended game that doesn't really have game sessions. So I'm guessing the arcade mode framework really allows you to kind of bring in that framework, that single session game kind of content into this game. I'm kind of curious to see how that works because in Near and Far, while you did have that individual game option, 
it was a little bit less satisfying. Like, it was still fun. I enjoyed playing those individual games, but there was a lot less of the story idea to it, and that game shone so well in the story. Mm -hmm. That being said, I did play a bunch of those individual games, especially at the beginning when we were first getting into it and we didn't have a group together yet. Once we got our group together, we mostly just played with the other people in our campaign group. But even still, like, I would play a game in Near and Far that didn't have... I wouldn't want to start another campaign right now because we just don't have time for it. Yeah. But I would play a one-off game. Yeah, Near and Far is a great game, and I'm like, cannot wait. I cannot wait for Sleeping Gods. But you I have will, to wait because that is Kickstarter. Uh, let's hope by the time it arrives, I still have that excitement and hype that I do right now. Here, why don't you make yourself feel better and talk about some <laughs> new Kickstarter games that All you right. could maybe buy? So this is my part of the game where we talk about new projects. So first up, we have After the Empire from Gray Fox Games, funding at eighty-four thousand of its thirty thousand dollar goal, with one thousand and seventy backers, ending Thursday, September twenty-sixth, with an estimated delivery of May 2020, you can back this for $85. And After the Empire is a competitive tower defense game with excellent components that build and upgrade your castle. Uh, the Kickstarter is going to include an absolutely ridiculous 235 miniatures, yep, for soldiers and invaders, which will also be cubes in the retail instead of these neat little miniatures, plus a ton of other cool component upgrades. I will, of course, say, if you didn't know this, we are sponsored by Gray Fox Games, so take that for what it is. Uh, I have had a chance to play this. I played it at PAX Unplugged early or late last year with Eric Buscemi from the Cardboard Horde. We talked about it on our PAX Unplugged recap episode when Eric joined us. Y'all did. Yeah, and I really enjoyed this. And I'm not a big fan of tower defense games, but having this kind of competitive tower defense, you all have your own castle that you're constructing and refitting and adding more better pieces to, more better pieces. And, you know, hiring the right soldiers and infantry and all the other fun stuff so that when the invaders come each round of the game, they're going to hit your castle in different ways from different angles, but it's going to affect all players differently. And that's a really awesome concept for a tower defense to me. You're, I'm so used to tower defense games like Castle Panic or things in that ilk of being this one central tower that you're all uh, cooperatively defending. And the way that it kind of manages how much money you have and what you're doing, so on and so forth, is really exciting. And I'm excited to see what the final version of this game looks like. It's gone through a good bit of development since Eric and I had a chance to play it. I would certainly hope so. I, From what I've heard, I knew BG from Board Game Gumbo has been playing this, and he's really, really been enjoying it. So you can always pop over to Board Game Gumbo and listen to that. I think they did a, a live play of it, actually, recently on the Board Game Gumbo channel. I believe you're right. Yeah, so after the Empire is going for another few weeks here, I super encourage you to go check it out and see if that is your thing. The new version of the campaign looks super solid. Um, they had canceled it a month or so ago because it wasn't quite where they wanted it to be and just kind of decided, hey, we're going to pull the plug after a few days and then relaunch a month later, and here it is, one month later, talking about After the Empire yet again. Uh, so a follow-up, if you back that first After the Empire, <laughs> you have to do it again, because that one it. that one is no more. All right, and second up, we have the Yido Deluxe Master Set from Board and Dice. This one is funding at 147000 of its $40,000 goal, with 1,565 backers. This one ends on Friday, September 20th, with an estimated delivery of August of 2020. You can back it for somewhere between $71 and $98, depending on what level of extras you want. Okay, and like you know when you back it at what level, right? Yeah, no. It's not just like a nebulous between <laughs> 71 and $98. You roll a D10 and add it to 70 and that's what you get. I'll, I'll, yeah. You should let me roll them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's already unlocked a few stretch goals too, which is exciting because this literally launched earlier today. We are actually recording this Monday evening and it launched this morning. So I got to add it on here because now we get to talk about it. Yeah. Um, Danielle, what all do you know about Yido? Because I feel like you know a little more about this one than I do. Well, no, I'm not entirely entirely sure that that's true. I know that we both got to see a, mm -hmm. sort of a in-the-works version of this deluxe set at Gen Con because we had a, a talk with Philippe from Board and Dice and he got to just show us what they were bringing out. I was originally really excited about this game when we first started getting into gaming. Mm -hmm. I think this this came out in like 2012. 2012. Yeah, okay. So it, it had just come out when we were starting to really, really get into modern board gaming. And I was excited about it. I was like, oh, this is one of those games I want to play. And I'm really glad that we didn't actually get a copy of it. Because <laughs> now looking back on it, that version of it would not have been a good fit for me then. It yeah. would be a slightly better fit for me now. But it w it's a mean, mean game. Mm -hmm. And being as we would generally play probably play this as a two-player game, I d that that's not really my bag. But... They have added a couple of really nice things to this deluxe master set that he was telling us about that I think is a really cool thing. They've added the ability to adjust 
the meanness in the game. So there are there are decks of cards that you are drawing from, and in this deluxe master set, you can either use just the really hard cards if you would like to get pounded into the ground by the game, <laughs> or you can mix in these slightly more pleasant cards. I mean, none of them are really good in this game, but ones that don't hit you quite as hard with the penalties so that you're still getting a lot of those hard cards, but you're also getting a little bit of a reprieve. I think this is something that, like, if you listen to Rolling Dice and Taking Names, they're sort of sunny day at the beach card that they always joked about with Robinson (laughs) Crusoe. I don't think you're going to get that, but maybe, like, only struck by lightning once. Yeah. Um, So I'm, I'm excited to see that they're doing it. The art on this looks absolutely Gorgeous. Yeah, they did an awesome job with the re. The yeah, I was gonna say the look of this game has gone from eh, sure fine to oh sweet Jesus, this is pretty. Yeah. So if you wanted a prettier copy of Yudo, you can certainly get that. It's got a little bit more adjustability to it. I know they had added. I think he said they had added a little bit more variability in the game itself. Yeah, there are workers that are now different kinds of Oh, that's right, they're specialized workers. 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 They had originally had just plain workers, and now that they've got specialized workers that you can get additional benefits if you play them out onto certain spaces. So this is really taking a game and giving it a really nice boost to make it the best it can be, and I'm Mm -hmm. excited to see that $147,000 worth of money has gone towards this game, and 1,500 people are going to get this better copy of Edo. Mm -hmm. That's huge, and that's less than 12 hours since the campaign has launched as well, so it's just blasting out the gate here. Oh, they fancy. Um, I'm actually kind of glad, in a way, that we had that little delay to record this afternoon, because if we hadn't, we wouldn't have been able to talk about this one until it was already over. It is only a 10-day campaign. So if this is something that is interesting to you, I highly encourage you to go and over and check out Yido Deluxe Master Set sooner rather than later. Very specifically, sooner rather than uh, any time up to or after Friday, September 20th. There you go. All right. Well, that is the end of, wait a second. No, it's not. It's the end of Kickstarters that we're talking about that we haven't played, even though I played after the Empire, but we'll ignore that because we've got a pair of of Kickstarter previews after the break here. So we're going to do that. Cool. The break thing, where we do a break. That's Let's not break we're... anything. Um, break. Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. Double Kickstarter preview time. Danielle, what are the stats for the first one? Okay, first we're talking about Lots, a competitive tower building game. From Royal N Games. That's N as in Nancy. So he Royal N Games. I think he wanted the uh, acronym to be RNG. Oh. Ah. Uh, ha ha ha. Uh, and if not, now you did. It plays one to four players in 20 to 30 minutes, and it is designed by Zach Connolly with art by Claire Donaldson. It is currently at $4,105 of its $8,000 goal. You can back it for $25, and it is ending on Monday, September 30th, with estimated delivery of April 2020. Yes, and this one also launched today, Monday, September 9th, 2019. Everything launches today. Oh, it's 20 years since the Sega Dreamcast today. That's a weird thing that you know. Yeah. I mean, it was nine nine ninety nine. Of course, you know you're going to remember that date forever, or at least until you f- forget. And, mm, you know, longer than anybody years. remembered the Sega Dreamcast. You, no, people still remember the Sega Dreamcast. I know, it's a very I'm, good system. Choo Choo um, Rocket, Sonic Adventure One and Two. You've just made a children's game. noise. Which one? Choo Choo Rocket. Choo Choo Rocket. <laughs> anyway, talking about Wait lots. Wait a minute, rockets we, don't even make a Choo Choo noise. We are talking about Lots, a competitive tower building game. If you would like to discuss Dreamcast games, please find us in Guild Two Four Seven Zero. Anyway, Lots, a competitive tower building game, is kind of like a almost a reverse Jenga in that you are building a tower rather than taking apart a tower. But it's way different than that in that you are rolling dice and then using uh, stacking tetromino pieces to kind of 3D assemble a tower out of some cool stuff. So you have all of your typical tetromino pieces. You have your L shape. You have your T shape. You have the Z shape. You've got long line. You've got square. All the friends are here, right? All my friends. All my friends. Long line (laughs) and Z shape. (laughs) Long line and Z shape. All my favorite friends are long line. <laughs> anyway, and then you've got a, a central board here with has a blueprint on it of, you know, whatever shape of squares. There's a bunch of different blueprints that you can put in there. But like your base one is just going to be a two by five rectangle. And there's ones that are kind of like a you know, shape that I can't describe in audio because this is an audio medium. And I'm trying to gesture with my hands. <sighs> I'm so sorry. Just we'll just go with the, the two by five rectangle. <laughs> yeah, they're just 
footprint shapes. Yeah, they're footprint shapes. But you're going to roll the die. Everybody's going to roll the die that has each of the different tetromino pieces on it, plus a wild side. And you're going to take one of those pieces to be your starting piece. On your turn, you're going to roll the die again. You're going to get a new piece, hopefully a different one. And maybe you're going not, to though. Maybe not. And you're going to choose one of those to add to the current blueprint tower in front of you. If you're the first person playing, it's going to be really easy. You just put it on the squares. You put your squares on the squares and you're like, yep, I did that. Got no points for it. But after that, you're going to have to start making choices. If you place a block that is touching one or more of the same kind of block that is also the same color, you're going to score two points per block of the same kind as it's touching. Also, if your block finishes out a layer, so you have a complete, like in this two by five rectangle scenario, you complete one of those two by five floors, you're going to score five points off of that as well. The obvious strategy you have here is that as you are building this thing up, you want to leave it so that by the time it gets back around to you, you're going to have something that you can probably touch a block to, or you know you don't want to leave a really perfect shape hole for somebody else to put a block in to finish one or even more floors, you know, because realistically you could have an L shape that fills in three or get the magical Tetris and fill in a whole bunch all at once. If you get that, somebody who you're playing with should have done something earlier. <laughs> but... As you are scoring points, you're going to be going around the score track on the outside, and there's actually going to be some different points that you can cross over. And unlike a whoever gets there first gets the reward, it's kind of interesting because the last player to cross either the single square purple block or the crew card is going to get that reward. It's kind of a good catch-up mechanism there. The one-by-one purple cubes go into a player's collection of blocks, and they can choose to place it with other blocks to you know either fill in a hole or make something not have an overhang because you can't place a block with an overhang. And then there's also these crew cards, which are kind of single-use powers. You're going to get one at the beginning of the game, and they do things like allow you to pretend that the block is a different color block for scoring, or maybe score half the points of somebody else's stuff, or maybe even take a block off of the tower. And so if you are the last person to cross one of those crew chief spots, you get one of those cards as well, which gives you a little bit more power for later in the game. But what if I'm a clumsy oaf? What if you are a clumsy oaf? Well, of course, there are accidents in any kind of construction site. And if you happen to knock any blocks other than the block you're replacing off of the tower, your turn is over and you feel sad and you score zero points for this turn. Any of those blocks just go back into the supply. So maybe you get a little bit more game out of it, which might be good if you want to have game, because the game will end when three of the five color supplies are empty. Or if somebody play or somebody reaches a certain number of points based on the player count, either 30, 35, or 40, depending on a four, three, or two player game. I did that first try. I'm very proud of me. Look at you knowing small numbers. Look at me being able to number. Look at me. I'm looking at you. Internet, look at me. I'm counting. So yeah, you're going to continue to go around until one of the end game conditions is met, and then whoever has the most points will be the winner of lots. We had this out at our game night last week at Good Road, and it's such a great kind of table presence game even with the prototype components that we had I think any kind of game where you're building a tower and you've got some really brightly colored polyomino blocks is going to draw eyes so we're playing this on a a tall table and it is really kind of fun to think about that strategy of I gotta place this in such a way that nobody else is able to finish something out maybe I gotta force the player two from me to place a particular block that's going to finish out a floor or put them in a position where they have to give somebody else a floor and that's really where the strategy is going to come in beyond that it's not a whole ton of super deep strategy this is a game that's intended for family play or you know just really quick play this is the kind of game that i would call sessionable you know this is definitely something you're finishing in 20 to 30 minutes that 20 to 30 minute time print is pretty accurate as well oh yeah i can't see this taking longer than half an hour if it is then I feel like you'd lose interest after about half an hour. Yeah, and I think that is the strength of it, is that it is a game that is exactly as long as it needs to be, and it will draw people's eyes. It's the kind of thing that if you are bringing new people into the game, uh, hobby and they want a dis- dexterity game with a little bit of strategy, lots might be that spot for you. You got to see this played a couple of times at Origins, right? <laughs> In giant yes. form? Yes. So uh, at the Origins Punchboard Media meetup, the designer Zach had brought his giant foam version of the game, which we, of course, called Big Lots because, you know. Because trademarks. Well, maybe it was Large Lots then. Yeah, Large Lots lawyers don't listen to that. Right. <laughs> The reason I said that is because I wanted to ask how many times had the game ended because pieces were gone. Because this seems like the kind of thing that should end on points most of the time. Our game certainly did. Um, It definitely, I definitely have had a game or two end on the pieces being gone. And it just kind of comes down to as you get to learn the game better, you kind of learn more about how you're stacking the pieces to maximize scores. Or if you're playing a really defensive game, you're placing the pieces so that nobody can score. And you're just kind of trying to keep on to that lead until that very end. And you're running out all the pieces. 
Fair enough. I also really liked the big lots because at the end of it, I was allowed to punch the tower down because I had won. You punched the tower down on our small copy as well. Well, I was told that that's the reward for winning, is you get to push over the tower. Fair enough. (laughs) So yeah, if you're interested in checking out Lots, you can find that on Kickstarter. It is going to be up through the end of the month, Monday, September 30th. It's about halfway to funding after its first day of launch. This felt a little bit like Team Up that we talked about from Helvetique Games about a year ago. It would have been a year ago, because I got that just after Gen Con last year. And that game while it was a lot of fun, was somewhat unforgiving in its scoring because you needed to be able to fill in full levels to score points um, as a team because it was a cooperative game. And as a cooperative game, it should be a little bit more difficult to score points. In a competitive game, you need everybody to keep scoring. So if you're looking for something that has that feel where you are trying to fit everything into a sort of compact space as opposed to just freeform building out everywhere. This is a competitive version of that, but it does feel a little bit more free-flowing with the points. Like, even if you can't get a level completion point, a five-point chunk for completing a level, Mm -hmm. you can get points for placing one of your pieces next to ones of the same color, and you always have an option of placing one of two pieces. Now, like I said earlier, you may have the same piece in your hand because you had one from earlier and you rolled the same thing again. But when, once you place that, you're going to get a chance to get something else. And if you go to take a piece and all of them are missing, I believe you get to pick whatever you want, correct? The player to your left Oh, the player to you. your left gets Mwahaha. to pick. Ah. But you, you do have more choices and there are more ways to score in this. So if either cooperative or difficult scoring rubric wasn't your thing, and that is the reason that you passed over team up, this might be something that you're interested in. Yeah, I would definitely give it a look. Uh, you can find it on Kickstarter until Monday, September 30th. And of course, that is Lots, a competitive tower building game. All right, up next, our second Kickstarter preview of this dual Kickstarter preview episode is the game that Danielle wants to talk about very badly. Very badly. It is a game called Calico. It is coming from Flat Out Games. It plays one to four players in 30 to 45 minutes. It is designed by Kevin Russ with art by Beth Sobel. And it's about cats. And quilts. Mostly cats, though. (laughs) So Calico goes live in October. We are getting a chance to play it early. We are passing it around to some other Punchboard Media members. So you'll obviously be seeing a lot of that on the network as the game goes live. And when it does come back around, we will be talking about it on the Kickstarter launch segment. But we wanted to talk to you fresh after we've had a chance to play a few games. So you can follow along as Calico travels around Punchboard Media. Like, I don't know, the sisterhood of the traveling cat. Okay, (laughs) was that good? I thought that was pretty good. The backer levels are not set yet, but apparently there will be a backer level that you can pledge to get your cat drawn into the game. No. Not that I know anybody who has a board game related cat that should be in this game. Our board game related cat is currently sleeping on me, but not. Continue to sort these papers. Paper. Two pieces. Can I can I tell them how the game plays? Danielle, please tell us about Calico, the game that our cat could be in. (laughs) In Calico, you are trying to create a quilt such that it not only is amenable to the wonderful cats that you have placed out for the game, because cats, as it turns out, really like patterns, and so that it has opportunities for you to place a bunch of buttons out and get the most points at the end of the game, because you get points for buttons and cats in this game. Buttons really like colors. And Go- yeah, buttons really like colors, and cats really... <laughs> That's how I explain it when I teach this game. Buttons really like colors, and cats really like patterns. Mm. What I'm talking about is everybody's going to start with this little dual-layer tray that has a inset that you can fit a bunch of hex tiles into, which is really convenient because this game comes with a bunch of hex tiles. Yay! Each of these tiles is in one of six patterns and one of six colors. So you may have a light blue striped hex tile or you may have a purple polka dotted hex tile or you may have a green hex tile in that pattern that i haven't found a really good way to describe yet there's one of them and i don't know what it is it's like a weird floral thing (laughs) everybody is going to start the game with one of these hex tiles and you are going to be drawing additional ones as it goes on so you're always going to have a choice of two very much actually kind of like lots that we were just talking about so you're going to have a choice of what you play On your turn, you're going to take one of the two hex tiles in your hand and you're going to place them out onto your board. If at any point the surrounding edge and or the tiles that you place onto the board have three of the same color touching, you're going to take one of the buttons of that color and place it onto one of the hexes that's empty on your board. And that's going to be worth three points for you at the end of the game. Hooray, you got three points. You did a good job. Yay. If at any point 
the patterns that you have on the edge of your board or on the hex tiles that you've placed onto your board meet the requirements of any of the three cats. That's right, the requirements of any of the three cats. One of those cats will come over and sit on one of the empty hexes Aww. that are involved in the pattern. Each game is going to have three different cats that are going to have three different types of pattern that you're trying to create. Each cat will have two patterns that it is looking for. So you divide the six total patterns in the game amongst the three cats at the beginning. And if you create the shape that is on that cat tile with the pattern that is preferred by that cat, you're going to take one of the cat tokens and put it onto the empty hex and it'll be worth a certain number of points at the end of the game. There are three levels of cat in each game. There is an easy, medium, and hard pattern to make, and they are worth points accordingly. The easy ones are usually worth three. I think the middle ones are worth five or seven, and the the harder ones, I think, are worth nine to 11. I like the thought of easy, medium, and difficult cats. All the cats are sleeping. They're all nice, easy, good Aww. cats. And anyway, you end up with this absolutely beautiful board, which has lots of quilt patches on it. It's got buttons. It's got cat tokens. The other way you are going to score points in this game, and this is what makes this game absolutely just brain-burningly fun to play. As much as I love cats and like to say that I want to play this game because it's got cats on it, I want to play this game because it has an absolutely cool puzzle. At the beginning of the game, everybody is going to start with six goal tiles. You are either in the basic game, you all pick the same three and place them out, or in the way that we've generally been playing, which is the advanced version of it, you each draw four tiles once you shuffled them up, and you get to pick three from the four you've drawn. So you started with the same pool, but you may end up with very different goal tiles than the other players in the game. The three that you've selected from that hand of four, you're going to place out onto the marked spaces on your board, and they are going to establish a pattern. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Arion a couple episodes back, mm -hmm. where you are going to want to have patterns like A, A, B, B, C, C. And this is in reference to the six hexes, which are going to be around the hex tile on your board, immediately around it. So maybe I have two yellow, two green, and two navy. That's A, A, B, B, C, C. Maybe I have two polka dot, two stripe, and two fern. That's, again, three sets of two. Each of these gold tiles can either be met with all color, with all pattern, or if you manage to meet the gold tile with both color and pattern, not necessarily in the same divisions, but if you've done it in both both ways, the color and the pattern, you will get a higher point value. If you only do it with one, there is a lower point value that you'll get. And there is no detriment that you receive for not doing it. So you really want to try to get these gold tiles. If you have scored each of the three different gold tiles, you'll get points from that at the end of the game. You'll get points for each of your buttons. Like I said, they are different colors. And if you collect one button of each color throughout the game, you get to place a rainbow button somewhere on your board, which is also worth three points, but also it's a rainbow, so that's fun. Yay! And you'll get points for those cat tokens, like I said, of their own value at the end of the game. You add up all those points, and that is your score in Calico. Whoever has the highest score wins. Kitties. And has the most cats and the best buttons and quilts and everything, and it's it's very good. How, how's the cat doing over there? He's asleep. Holy... Our cat is just like passed out upside down. Talk about the game, All right. Rick. Anyway, uh, Calico, I had seen at the last few conventions, had you know some pre-hype going on, had demos of it at their booth, and I had not had a chance to play it up until we got a chance to play the preview here over the last few weeks. And I got to say, I am so excited that this game is as brain burning as it is, because I feel like it's the kind of game like Sagrada in a way that it has this awesome theme with a really, really cool placement puzzle that's going to keep you coming back again and again. And it's the kind of game that the theme and the attractiveness of it, the great production, and this is a prototype or a preview copy of it, and the production on this is already fantastic. The art is amazing. The component design is really, really strong as well, that it makes me want to continue to play it. And I was actually really bummed that we had to send this on to somebody else. Yeah, obviously. And we have to be good shares. Yeah, absolutely. But... One of the things that I think made you super frustrated, but in a good way about this game, was that when you place a tile onto your board, which you're going to be doing every turn, you then draw another tile up into your hand. But you can never draw from the face down stack. You can only ever draw from a row of three, which is face up in the center of the board. 
So you know exactly what's going to be available to you coming into your turn. And on the player's turn before it, more often than not, I'm sitting there going, <laughs> if there's a, t- a hex I want out there, and maybe it completes both my color and my pattern around this one gold tile, I'm just sitting there going, don't you take the tile. And I'm hoping that they're so focused on what they're doing that it's not a point where they can look around and see what other people need. Because there are definitely points in this game where you're not going to be holding a tile that is the crucial tile to you, but you always have to play a tile out onto your board. You have to sometimes put things in places you don't want them on your quilt. Yeah. So I'm hoping that that's not the point in the player next to me's game where they're just like, well, how can I do the most damage? Because I'm not helping myself. And <sighs> sometimes it was, and they took that one hex, and I know I did it to you a couple of times. But Twice, same tile, same game. <laughs> but it, it is certainly... Knowing that you can't take from that face down, you can never just luck into something. You have to really be planning for what is available to you. I really like that. And every time I taught this game, I taught it most of the games that we played with yeah, it. Yeah, you definitely. I didn't teach any. Uh, I would always say it is a really simple game to do a turn of. All you're going to do is play one of the two things in your hand and draw one of the three things off the board. If you've done any scoring, take the token for the scoring, put it onto your board. Mm -hmm. And you can always check the scoring at the end of this. The only time that you're going to not be able to see if a score was was done 100% correct is if you join two button regions. Mm -hmm. But almost all of the scoring in this game can be checked at the end. So... You're not going to miss out on a bunch of points. But having explained you just play a tile and draw a tile, it can absolutely feel like you are making a monumental decision, even <laughs> even with the light theme of this game. And that's, I mean, I love that this game has a really nice, fun, light theme. Because, wow, the way you're looking at this going, I have a blue tile and I could put it next to these other blue and get the button now, but the pattern doesn't really work with what I was going for here. But if I put it around this gold tile, that'll be good, even though it doesn't go with the pattern that the cat wants for that tile. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, this other tile is over there. Maybe I can draw that up into my hand and work towards this other pattern. It is definitely a game that you think about. Mm -hmm. But it is an elegant game. We talked about this with Sagrada a ton. All you're doing playing a tile and drawing a tile and you only have two options to play and three options to pull and it's so good yeah so good and cats what continually comes back to me about calico as well is that it has a really kind of playful anxiety curve uh whenever i have these kind of placement games with a lot of different scoring things i get this the first maybe quarter or third of the game i'm going at it i'm just like yeah i'm so right on with my goals and then in the second third i'm just like Okay, well, I guess I'll just go for the second level on this goal. And then that last third of the game, I'm just like, game, you give me that one tile. There's one tile that I can pull this thing off with. And it's really, it's playful in a way. It's a playful kind of frustration Mm -hmm. in that all of the decisions that I make early on that I think are going to be, oh, this is so easy for me to luck into this. You don't get what you want. (laughs) And you have to make those concessions as the game goes on of, well, I'm going to abandon this goal. I'm going to abandon trying to get five in a row of this particular thing. Because you have so many different things to choose from, and you got to choose the ones that make the most sense. And this game never lets you f- take yourself too seriously, though. Like, Because every once in a while, you have to be like, oh, does that complete the queenie pattern? <laughs> Do I have the, the perfect mittens pattern? Did I get my pink flower button for putting three pink tiles next to each other? Like, it keeps you light in this playfulness. Yeah. And it's, it's just so good. I like it. Mm-hmm. Well, that is Calico. It is going on Kickstarter in October. If you would like to follow along, you can obviously check out punchboardmedia.com, search for Calico, and you will find our other content creators. I think Open Seed Gaming will have it next. They definitely, that's who we mailed it to, so I (laughs) sure hope they have it next. So go on over and check out Open Seed Gaming. Obviously, there's links at punchboardmedia.com. And obviously, follow along with um, Flat Out Games. You go to their website, you can sign up to be notified when that Kickstarter campaign goes live. And then we'll figure out how we're going to get bonus in this game. Not gonna do it. Come on, look at him. I Don't you want you want Beth Sobel to draw our cat all sleepy passed out on the sofa? Just being like, I'm so asleep right now, nobody's ever gonna know. Except the internet, because Dad told him. I told everybody. I'm sorry, bonus, everybody knows. Well, that means it's time for us to move on to another game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. 
So our recent plays this week are actually also our on tap because we had two Kickstarter previews. So we're going to be talking about Slide Quest, which is a 2019 release from Blue Orange Games, which plays one to four players in 15 to 45 minutes. The designers are Nicolas Bourgeon uh, and Jean-Francis Rojas. The artist is Stefan Escapa, and this is a game of cooperative dexterity with wacky sliding. Wacky sliding. Wacky sliding. So if you ever played a marble rolling game called Labyrinth in your youth, or recently, I guess, if you want, that still exists, um, it's kind of a game where you have a wooden box that has knobs on the two sides that allows you to kind of... X and Y rotate a platform, which you roll a marble through, kind of a maze. And in this maze, there's a bunch of holes. Slide Quest takes that and puts a really cool, fun, kind of cartoony theme on it, where you are cooperatively, with all of the different players, maneuvering a little knight figurine around a different set of maps. And you're actually going to be swapping out the uh, kind of cardboard overlay of the map, depending on what level of the game you are on. And levels that go on further are going to have different hole patterns or different patterns and for paths for you to go on or different monsters or dynamite explosives and all this other stuff that you have to avoid. But the main mechanic is the same. Instead of knobs, however, they have these kind of levers that are going to go under the four sides of the box. And each player in a four player game, for example, is going to be controlling one of the levers. And this is kind of where the multiplayer chaos of it comes in. Kind of in a game like Magic Maze. I also had that thought. Yeah, where you are, one player is controlling just up, the other player is controlling just left, and somebody else can control the teleporters. In this, very much the same way, multiple players are going to have to work together to follow the winding path on each level of the game to get your fearless knight, or maybe fearful knight. It's up to you how you want to anthropomorphize this plastic figurine. He could fall in holes. He should be somewhat fearful. It is kind of scary when you fall in holes. But you're going to move it throughout the thing, and if you do all the things right, then you're going to feel really good and you're going to go on to the next level um pretty much that's it if there are monsters in a level you have to knock them into holes in specific orders generally there are some boss monsters as well that you have to do deal with in certain ways there are opportunities for you to gain more health so if you do fall in a hole you have i guess less hole pain it's hit points you have you have hit points and if you have hit points hole pain same letters yeah totally fine then you don't (laughs) die and there's also little sticks of dynamite that if you knock them over and they fall in holes they explode and that's bad don't have explosives but yeah uh, we had a chance to play this when you were up in minneapolis this weekend we were hanging out with gates and brad and they had brought it to modest brewery where we were hanging out uh good good fun brewery i encourage everybody to go check out modest if you're in the minneapolis area fun stuff but we had a chance to play this and this is a really fun kind of pub game and i think it was the kind of dexterity game that i feel works well in a pub setting because you don't have pieces flying everywhere and that's really kind of important for dexterity games in pubs yeah so many times we talk about games that would be great to play at a bar or at a game night at a bar or whatever but it's like oh but you have to throw and you could definitely knock a glass over or you have to move really quickly and You're not going to be watching what you're doing as much as you should be when you're around (laughs) glasses of liquid. But this game was really wholly contained in the box and the the levers that you're pressing. Now, that's not to say it's a quiet and sedate game, because you're definitely going to be (laughs) making decisions on how you think the other person should be adjusting their lever and at what speed and whether they need to go up or down or whatever. And you're going to be yelling at each other back and forth in a fun, playful way. But it definitely is better than something where you're going to have pieces. You're not going to Jenga at a pub because that's going to make a mess. Or at least I wish people would stop Jengaing at pubs. Please stop Jengaing at pubs, especially giant Jenga in small pubs. I don't understand it. Just play Slide Quest. It's contained in the box. I was also surprised at how much actual strategy there was in this game. Usually you don't have a lot of dexterity and cooperative strategy in a dexterity game. But I really feel like there were a number of times where we're looking at the setup and everybody's just kind of like, nobody's moving at all. And we'll be like... Gates, you need to press down just a little bit, and Brad's going to press down a little bit as well. We're going to come around the back of this, and we're going to be able to push this monster in. And eight times out of 90, it worked, (laughs) you know. But I think that that is the fun of this, and I feel like Slide Quest is the kind of game that will have a good bit of staying power. It's a unique enough dexterity game that is also a good party scenario game. And it has enough content in there that you're going to be able to play a bunch of different levels of it before you get super bored on it. The other thing about this game that feels a little bit like Magic Maze that I'm a little worried about, actually, yeah, is that it was fun while we played it. We played it maybe like 10 or 15 maps. We yeah. played a, a bunch of maps one time. And I want to play it again. It would be fun to play again. But I wonder if after like the 10th time you play this, 
Mm. It stops being as fun. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the fun in this game is the gimmick of those levers and getting the little knight to slide along the path. And it is often very difficult when he's moving. There is friction between the flat bottom of this piece and the the flat <laughs> board that he's sliding on. So you do have to sort of finagle the board in order to tilt it at enough of an angle to get him to move, but not tilt it too much that he overshoots where you're going and either knocks something where it doesn't belong or falls into a hole or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I feel like either once you get really, really good at that, or after you've done it a bunch of times and you don't get really, really good at it, that might stop being super fun. Now, they did provide a lot of levels, so if you do get good at it, you have a lot of game here, and there are arches, and there are monsters, and there's dynamite, and there's a lot of variability. Yeah. But I do kind of wonder, like, is this better for a bar to own to have people play, or people who have a game night to own to have people play? If you're regularly playing with the exact same group, I feel like it might get a little tiring. Yeah, I could see this also being a really good fit for families. Like, I'm thinking thinking of the reads right now. I feel like this is the kind of game that would fit in really well with their family. If you've got a bunch of kids who are old enough to understand that you don't just slam your hand down on the (laughs) lever every time, because that's just going to end up in somebody crying. Yeah. Probably Uh, mom or dad. (laughs) But, like, if you have, you know, a little bit older elementary school age kids who understand that when you press the lever, it moves the board a an equal amount yeah this this could be definitely a fun thing to do yeah well i personally like you said i would like to get more plays of slide quest and hopefully we can come across a copy at some point and i feel like it would be again a game that would fit in really well at our monthly game nights now since we talked about this being so good to play in a bar and so nice and <laughs> self-contained or to play around glasses of liquid why don't we put it on tap yeah so first up we've got from a southern barrel brewing company in bluffton south carolina The Slippery Slope Double IPA. It's 8.5% ABV and 80 IBU. This one is hazy orange color, full-bodied, and big hop flavor. I did go on their website to get some information about it, and the information in very big capital letters, it just says, A Very Smooth Double IPA. Ah, you got the fun of going to the brewery websites this time. I made the (laughs) list, but you put the notes together. Oh, yes. All right, Danielle, what is our number two? From Lake Placid Pub and Brewery in Lake Placid, New York, we have Big Slide IPA. Hmm. It is a 7.0% ABV, 70 IBU IPA. It is big, slightly piney IPA brewed in tribute to the local ski jumps at the 27th High Peak. Lake Placid, obviously, known for some skiing. Mm-hmm. So this is their uh, their Big Slide IPA. And obviously, I don't need to explain why Big Slide IPA goes with Slide Quest. Next up, from Martin House Brewing Company in Fort Worth, Texas, we have Box Slider. It is a Bach that is 5 per- 5.6% ABV and 18 IBU. This is an easy-drinking, copper-colored, lightly hopped beer brewed in honor of the Toadies. They did that song Possum Kingdom that you're only really now learning the name of. Yeah, and they are a Fort Worth band as well. <laughs> yes. And I had to put this on the list because, I mean, if anybody's going to have a slide beer and, I mean, we're the box. We're so the box. Yeah. It's box later. It's the one and only Going chance. on the list. Yeah, there it is. Finally, from Arbor Brewing Company in, I see why you gave me this, Ipsil- Ipsilanti, Michigan. Ipsilanti. It is... Tilted Earth IPA series. This is their IPA series that they do. The current one is the Summer IPA that is 5% ABV and 43 IBU. It's a rotating series. I believe it's usually a session series. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Summer one is a cold fermented session IPA with Amarillo, Huel Melon, and Cashmere Hops. And it is canned. That is the current availability. I anticipate that they will soon be switching into their fall offering for that, but it'll still be available under the Tilted Earth series. Yeah, it is September. Time to bring out all of the pumpkin and fall beers, right? I'm drinking a gorgeous right now. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. Well, you feel like... Where's that word coming from? Well, if you would like more information on these or any other beers we have talked about in the past, you can always go to draftmechanic.net and click the show notes section because that's where Danielle, the lovely wife and co-host and very smart half of this podcast, does the show notes. (laughs) I was just laughing at the idea that that website has every beer we've ever talked about. It has like a lot. A whole lot of them. Only the ones we talk about on the podcast. (laughs) Very true. Well, you can go there, you can listen to that, or you can listen to this quick break and we'll be back with our six packs of sessionable games. After the fall of Rome, Europe entered into the Dark Ages, but with the rise of feudalism, prosperity returned to the area. In After the Empire, you are a medieval ruler trying to grow and defend your fiefdom. Players will gather resources, build buildings, enlist troops, and recruit skilled refugees to both increase the value of their city and fortify its defenses against impending invaders. 
Having a more valuable fiefdom yields greater rewards, but also brings more invaders looking to get their cut of what's yours. If they manage to sack, you will lose gold, your buildings will be damaged, and your refugees may be injured. Whoever city is most prosperous at the end of the game is the winner of After the Empire. Check it out on Kickstarter on September 3rd from Gray Fox Games. Gray Fox Games. Quality games, cleverly crafted. All right, for this episode of Draft Mechanic, we have put together a six-pack. Actually, we've each put together a six-pack of what we think our favorite six sessionable games are. What the heck does that mean? Well, it's kind of just a fun word that I've decided to use because we were thinking about what we wanted to do for a six-pack, and we said, let's talk about games we can play in 30 minutes or less. And we actually kind of developed this as we were talking about it. So the definition of a sessionable game is a game that you can play, if everybody knows it, 30 minutes from the time you open the box to when you finish scoring. Yeah, Fair. that takes out anything that has a ridiculous setup, even if the game is short. Yeah, very true. This is why you won't see, like, Among the Stars on here, which is a game that you can play in 30 minutes if you have enough people that know what they're doing. But I couldn't, I can't set up a game of that in less than 10 minutes, honestly. Yeah, I was going to say, you can barely set up a game of that in <laughs> half an hour. Yeah, so that cuts out a lot of games with a lot of pieces that play pretty quickly. And I think that that actually was an interesting constraint, because when I look at my list, all of my games are pretty simple, but they have either a good strategy and depth in terms of what I'm doing with them, or just, you know, there's a very few components that do a lot of things. The other thing that at least I took into account, and looking at the notes here, it looks like you may not have had the same restriction. Just the one. I know, but... I did not consider games that you always play more than once. Right. Which took a lot of party games. Like, Just One was my second favorite game of last year. Yeah. I love that game. It is definitely a game, if I had half an hour, I would maybe play. But the game is best when you can run a round of it, and then run another round of it, and then run another round of it. It's why Codenames is not on my list. It's why Just One is not on my list. It's why one of your games is not on my list. They're all games I like quite a bit, but I want to play them several times through, giving everybody a chance to maybe be one of the roles and really get into the feeling of it, get a groove going in the game. So when you do that, they turn out to be way more than 30 minutes because you're playing six, seven rounds of them or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. So I that's why mine it does not have a bunch of party games in it. Okay, totally understandable. But just one is very good. As his code names. <laughs> All right. Well, then I will start out with my contentious pick. Uh, one of the games that I have chosen for this list is Insider. This is from Oink Games, designed by Kwaji Daichi Okano, Kito Shinma, and Akihiro Ito. Uh, Insider is a party game that I love very much. It has been, quote unquote, re implemented as wear words. But in its base simplicity, you have a player who is the master, you have a player who is the insider, and everybody else is a regular commoner. The master knows the word on a card, and they close their eyes. And then the insider also looks at the word on the card, closes their eyes. Everybody else's eyes are closed during all of this, for example. And then you, oh, everybody opens up their eyes, you flip over a five minute sand timer, and then you go. And the players in the game, all of the commoners plus the insider, are going to ask yes or no questions of the master to try to guess what that word is. The thing that I love about this game is that you are trying to, if you are the insider, you are trying to get to the answer without anybody knowing you were the insider. And that leads to you asking, either asking some really obvious questions awkwardly or really stop or really stopping yourself from asking obvious questions because you don't want to give it away. And I've super enjoyed the way this game has developed kind of a meta in our group in a way. The way anytime we flip over a card, we say, is it a person? Is it a place? Is it a thing? Is it a doctor? Is it a nurse? And because that worked once and we all thought that person was the insider, but we just got really lucky. And it's just created so many fun, interesting stories that I think the simplicity of insider is what makes it so strong. Where words, like I said, does a very similar thing, but it has complicated setup. You've got a put up a bunch of stuff on your iPad and you've got all the roles and everybody's got roles and all this nonsense and all this extra fluff that you don't need because the core nugget at the base of Insider is so strong. Um, I will say, if you play it with five or six people, which is the recommended number, and it's five minutes per person, you will get this done in 30 minutes, technically. If That's untrue, though, because you still have to do the everybody close their eyes, Insider, look at the card, flip over the card, <laughs> flip it back. Hey, there's no timer during any of that part, so I don't think that counts towards the game timer, It does right? count. This really is the game I was talking about earlier <laughs> that would have also been on my list if I had put this type of game on my list. We also very often just sit here and pass the insider around in a circle and play 
more than one go around. We've definitely played this for longer than 45 minutes and had a good time about it. Mm -hmm. And there is chat between each of the rounds about, oh, why did you ask this question? Why did you ask that? So if you've got five to six players, you are going to pass that half hour threshold, I feel like. Yeah, you're not wrong, but I am going to allow it in as my... No, it's it's fine. I understand why you put it on this (laughs) list, and it is of the games that I talked about of... Just One and Codenames and Insider. Insider is the one that is most likely to be under half an hour, for Mm -hmm. sure. 100%. All right. Well, that is Insider from Oink Games. Danielle, what's the first on your list? First on my list is also kind of a stretch, I guess. Yeah, stretch it out. Because it could technically take longer than half an hour, but it shouldn't. I'm going to talk about Keyforge, which is obviously a two-player dueling card game Hmm. from Fantasy Flight. And at tournaments we've played they have expected multiple games to be done in under half an hour so i'm and the recommended time says anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes on bgg (laughs) but i can't think of a game once we once we got the rules down and we we were playing it correctly i can't think of a game of keyboards that has lasted longer than half an hour okay fair so i mean and it's not the kind of game like even if i played a game of it i don't necessarily want to immediately play another game of it particularly if we each just have the one deck Mm -hmm. because while it is cool to take a time and learn from your deck and see like how i could better use the three houses that i've got to go against the three houses that you've got more often than not i'm like okay i've seen what this does against that now i can take that and put it into my meta knowledge but i don't necessarily want to play these two decks against each other right again So it really does feel a little bit more like a one-off than some of those other games where you could play repeated ones. Yeah, this one is actually the one that I bumped off of my list to put Insider on, so I'm glad that we both had kind of a tenuous one for this spot in our list. We also cheated because you knew I was going to put it on my list. Maybe I did. (laughs) Yeah, maybe a little. Maybe a little. All right, well, that is Keyforge from Fantasy Flight Games. Next up on my list, I have Custom Heroes from AEG. This is designed by John D. Clare. This is a customizable card game in that the cards themselves are customizable. They call it a card crafting game. And it is a kind of a, a, a ladder climbing game where somebody is going to play, you know, a n- group of uh, one number and the next player has to play a group of that size with a higher number, so on and so forth. Uh, there's all sorts of games like this. You know, Capitalism, a classic card game that is like this and um, a whole bunch of other stuff. But the, the joy in Custom Heroes for me lies in the customization where as you are playing the game you're actually sliding additional cards into each of the cards to manipulate their values and add powers and make it really interesting and custom heroes is one of these games that i feel like we forget about every few months and then we put it back in the bag and we're just like oh yeah this is a really great quick game and if you have it set up and you are playing with people that know this can be a really quick play because you're just going to play until somebody scores enough points to get out and that's pretty much the end of the game for you you know after uh, they score enough points to to win This is the game that made it important that we weren't counting cleanup on (laughs) on your half an hour time. Because at the end of the game, you have to pull, it's like Mystic Veil, you have to pull all of those Mm -hmm. additional cards out and make sure you're not pulling out the cards that are intended to stay in. So the cleanup on this one can be a little bit of a bear, but it is a fun card game with a lot of people. It falls in that category with like Bonanza, where it's great with a higher player count. Yeah. And it just gets so absolutely wacky later in the game. It's incredible how fast the ramp up escalation of this game can take place but custom heroes is one of those games and i always forget about until i'm making a list like this and it seems to pop up on a lot of my six pack lists for all sorts of different reasons because it is a really unique and really fun game got Uh, a pair of 18s here yeah exactly um yeah that is custom heroes my next one is going to be monster match which is a game we haven't talked about in a while but we like a whole ton for a really really simple game international north american world champion monster match right here i thought morgan took your title No, that was just a regional, and I wasn't participating in that. Fair enough. Monster Match is a game from North Star Games where you're going to put out a bunch of cards, 10 cards face up around a center token, and you are going to roll these two dice, one of which has a number, one of which has a feature of all of the monsters, you know, eyes, legs, uh, what is it, eyes, legs, hands, hands. arms, they're just the three, I think. Yeah, just the three. Monsters only have three features. Obviously. Oh, yeah, and we always think something is a tail, but there there There's is no, no tails. No tails on monsters. Um, and everybody is going to try to touch one of the cards that's face up on the table that meets the criteria. So if I roll three eyes, everybody's going to want to point to a monster that's face up on the table that has three eyes. I, I, if there I. are no monsters on the table that have three eyes, somebody's going to want to take the disc in the center that says none and 
you are going to get points for the number of donuts on the bottom of the monster card that you have pointed to. If you haven't pointed to a monster card, you don't get points. If you have pointed to the nil token correctly, you're going to flip out a bunch more monsters and keep going, and you're going to play until you run out of monsters. At that point, you're going to count up the donuts that everybody has on their pile of monsters. Now, if at some point you grab the nil token in the middle and you were wrong, there was a monster with three eyes, what are you talking about? This one right here. Then you're going to need to take one of the monsters that you've scored and put it back out onto the table, and then you're giving up points. And feel shame about it. At the end, whoever has the most donut points wins, which is always a great thing in life. Mm. It's stupid fun, and I love it. I don't know I don't know why I love it so much. Maybe <laughs> it's the monster that looks like an ottoman that doesn't have any eyes or legs or arms. Maybe it's just how goofy it is and how you can look at these cards for three minutes straight and be like, this one has four eyes, this one has five eyes, this one has three eyes. If I roll it, I just need to point to these. But then as soon as you roll that die... You're like, oh, what What are eyes? I don't remember what eyes are. Are those the legs ones? No, those are the <laughs> eyes ones. It's silly. I've seen people who are serious gamers just break down into goofy kids playing this game, and I love it. Yeah. And it definitely takes less than half an hour, and it's not the kind of game that we've played repeatedly over and over again. Largely because by the end of it, you're like, oh, God, what are, what are features? <laughs> <laughs> so that's Monster Match. All right. My next up is Catch the Moon from Bombix. This is designed by Fabian Rafaud and Juan Rodriguez. This is a kind of almost cooperative dexterity game in which you are basically building a tower of ladders together. You start with a plastic base that has pegs for two ladders to go into, and then on your turn you are rolling a die, you are choosing a ladder out of the pile of ladders, and you are stacking this little wooden ladder onto the other existing ladders in the structure. Depending on what how your die rolled, you put it on one ladder or two ladders, or your ladder has to be the highest point in the feature. It's cooperative in that you're building all in the same thing. It's very not cooperative in that you want to be the only person that doesn't drop any ladders. So if any ladders fall off of the structure, you take a tear from the moon because the moon is very sad that you dropped its ladder. I feel like I it's guess. collaborative competitive, not yeah. cooperative competitive. There you go. Collaborative. Collaborative. But yeah, so Catch the Moon is... A game that seems very simple on its surface, but as you get a feel for the structure and the way that the ladders kind of hold together and the tension and kind of the, the friction of the wooden pieces, you really start to do some crazy stuff. And we have had some games of Catch the Moon that have, instead of just being inches tall, we're kind of measuring in feet. We've had some really, really amazing towers, and it definitely has some of the best table presence of a dexterity game in our collection. Um, I adore Catch the Moon. I think it is beautiful. I think it is weirdly zen-like i'll often play this game by myself just to see how well i can stack ladders it's Weird. kind of like a reverse bonsai tree in that way i guess because you're what do you think a bonsai tree is well you have the tree and then you're kind of taking little pieces off here and there to make it look pretty and i'm doing that with ladders but in reverse i'm adding them on none of those pieces are ladders no but it's why it's a metaphor and not an actual tree Oh. I was hoping you could just, you know, take that one level of ab abstraction with me, Danielle. Nah. <sighs> anyway, Catch the Moon, it's very good. It is very good. <laughs> it is fun, and we definitely have kept this in our game night bag for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So yeah, check it out, Catch the Moon. My next choice is Patchwork, because Patchwork is great. Do we even need to talk about why Patchwork is great at this point anymore? We do, because this is a podcast. I we might have new know, listeners. I know, but Patchwork is a great game. It is elegant. It, like I was talking about earlier, talking about Calico being elegant. Patchwork is even more elegant. You are taking a piece and you are putting it onto your quilt and you're just trying to fill up the square. And you can take any one of the three pieces that are in front of the pawn and the pawn moves forward to in front of the piece that you took. And it's really all about what options you take for yourself and what options you give to the one other player that you're playing this game with that makes it feel like such an excellent game. If you are setting this up and you're just throwing, you know, throwing your tiles in a loop around the, uh, the central scoring board, you throw out a couple of those leather patches and you're good to go. And then you're just, you're just going. And as long as you don't get in your head too badly... This is under half an hour. Mm -hmm. This could be a two hour long game, and I would absolutely hate that. <laughs> but that is very much an AP player being AP. So I guess you could probably say that that is a caveat here, but Patrick is an amazing game. And with two players, it is a really good 
thinky puzzle that is also super fun and not overly complicated. I love it. I know you are a big fan of this game as well, and I would love to play it if I had half an hour. Yes, patchwork is beautiful. Very often one of the first things that comes out if I am at a game night early and one other person shows up. It's also really great if you have half an hour and you have your phone, because the app implementation is, as we've talked about before, Mm -hmm. excellent. Mm -hmm. That is Patchwork from Mayday Games? Yeah, Mayday Games. Up next on my list, I have Scarabia. This is from Blue Orange Games. It's designed by Bruno Catala and Ludovic Montblanc. And this is actually kind of a distillation of an older game of theirs. The Cleopatra and the Society of Architects had a palace... um, was it the roof? It was I the guess? palace tiles. Yeah, yeah, the palace tiles on the roof. But in Scarabia, basically, you have a frame that you are going to place an inset board in, and the inset board is going to have different rocks that you have to work around, and there's also these scarab symbols, and you're going to have a bunch of polyomino tiles that everybody is going to draw the same polyomino tile at the same time on their turn, and they're going to choose where to place it on their board with the goal of sectioning off some of those scarabs. If you section a scarab, or if you section scarabs into sections of, I think, one to four spaces, you get to score out of them. And it's the kind of game where if everybody's just looking at everybody else's stuff, you could just all do the same thing. Don't be those people. By turn two, your boards look completely different because everybody's got like a, oh, I totally, this is the greatest move that nobody else is thinking of. And then by turn six, you're like, well, this was a terrible move and I've completely blocked myself out. But while it does take a little bit longer to set up because you do have to sort out all the pieces, I feel like the box design is pretty good because it's separated everything out. And also, I've never had a game of this from bell to bell be more than 15 minutes. Yeah, that's fair. And it plays really quick, and I feel like you get enough brain burniness out of it. You get enough real crunchy bits as you're trying to move your polyominoes in different interesting positions to get those scarabs just the right way. And then you do, and then you feel very, very good. Or you don't, and you feel very, very silly, but the game is only like 10, 15 minutes, so you're not going to feel bad about it. Yeah, I've never gotten to the end of this game and beaten myself up about my score. Like, I've definitely felt like I did a stupid thing. I miscounted the number of squares that I was going to have in my grouping around a scarab and been like, oh, it's five. I can't score that. And there's nothing that's going to fill in that one space or whatever. Yeah. But at the end of it, it's just like, oh, well, that was fun. I didn't I didn't do what I should have. It's not great. It's not terrible at the end of it because it's so quick. (laughs) Yes. But I really enjoy it. And I feel like this is always a good quick. Eh, We got 30 minutes. Let's play Scarabia. My next pick is Welcome to from Deepwater and Blue Cocker Games. This is, I think, the first rando writer that we've got on the list. It won't be the last. I'm going to spoil that. But <gasps> Spoilers. Yeah, I'm, I'm the worst. But it is a fun flip and fill game where you are trying to put house numbers on houses on three different blocks and you are trying to fill in pools appropriately and complete parks and use your adjustment powers to do construction in the appropriate places and so on and so forth. Divide up your neighborhood with fences and make different little real estate decisions on the value of groups of houses. There are enough powers to make the game interesting and to give you interesting decisions, but not so many powers that you are bogged down by what you could possibly do going forward in the game. There are enough different numbers and enough restrictions on how you can place the numbers that it makes you think about what you're doing, but there are enough ways to affect those numbers, be it with the construction that allow you to adjust them, or with the beast special ability, which allows you to place something next to a number that is already on your board, that you aren't absolutely blocked out by the third turn of the game. I really enjoy it. I know they've got a ton of new pads that we have that we need to start looking at. But it is just a really good game. You can play it with any number of people, but even with a hundred people, it's not going to take you more than half an hour because you're all going at the same time. So this is really great if you need to knock out a game for a big group because no matter how many people you add, you're still just going to be looking at the same three cards and everybody takes one. And when it's time to move on, it's time to move on. I like it a lot. It's definitely been on my top games of, I think it was 2017. Yeah, it was last year's list. Yeah. So last year was 2018. Just, just yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> Time keeps on slipping. slipping I don't slipping, know slipping. what year it is, but it is it is definitely a game I enjoy and will always break out if I have the chance. Cool. Well, that is welcome to from Deepwater and Blue Cocker Games. All right. Next up on my list, this is the first of many times for the next few months you are going to hear me say the words Las Vegas Royale. 
Ah, it feels so good. From Ravensburger, this is designed by Rudiger Dorn, and I'm very specifically saying Las Vegas Royale with the classic rules. You will know this as the original Las Vegas rules. Uh, Las Vegas Royale has the base rules. It has a bunch of the Las Vegas Boulevard stuff. It also has all the new Royale stuff. Everything is in the box. Get it. It's freaking awesome. But let me talk about Las Vegas Classic. I was going to shenanigans, because if you play with some of that new stuff, it definitely takes longer than half an hour. 100%. I totally agree. But yeah, Las Vegas Royale with the classic rules is the basic version of Las Vegas, where you have your six casinos. Everybody has a fistful of eight dice. And on your turn, you roll your dice. You're going to choose one of the numbers of your dice to assign all dice of that number to one of the casinos. At the end of everybody assigning all of their dice, uh, whoever has the most dice in a casino is going to win one of the payout cards on that particular casino. Second place will get the second place card. Um, In Las Vegas Royale, they have clarified it. It is always three rounds and there are only two cards per casino, which makes the setup incredibly fast. And I actually really like it. I really like that because then you're just going for a first and a second place and I feel like it's going to streamline that game a lot. If you want to, you can still play the, oh, we'll do $70,000 total payout across all you know stuff of the casino. But what that does is it eliminates single pay out casinos, which after playing it with some of the new stuff, I actually really like. I Mm. like having a first and a second because then it gets you an incentive to get in on every casino because that first place person may tie with somebody and then there's still an opportunity to get in and get that second place uh, casino payout on that particular casino. Mm. I think that the components of Las Vegas Royale actually did a really good job. You know, people are going to complain, oh, it doesn't have the old weird 90s artwork of casinos that kind of vaguely looks like actual casinos. Are people actually going to complain about that? People have have already complained plenty about the fact that the new version of Las Vegas Royale has really clean art direction, hmm. which is how I'm going to say it. It also has a really nice little dice tray in the center, and it's a hexagon now, and I like hexagons. But yeah, Las Vegas Royale, with the classic rules, can be played in under 30 minutes with people that you know, that people, or not people that you know, yeah. <laughs> I guess you probably know them as well, but people that know the game already, and I feel like it always produces enough fun for me to want to get it out. Um, I would certainly hope so. We own three copies of it. Oh, yeah, but uh, I'll be honest, I'll keep the Boulevard just because I want to have, you know, that legacy piece, but I don't need the tiny box version because Las Vegas Royale does literally everything I want this game to do. Okay. So, yeah, Las Vegas Royale. It came out of Gen Con. It's available now. I think everybody should have this game in their collection because it's awesome. My next pick is going to be Seikatsu, which is from IDW Games. This is a game where you have little Bakelite chips, and they have both birds and flowers on them. The flowers are in a ring around the outside, and it is absolutely best played with three players. You can play it with anywhere from two to four, but this is a three-player game. In this game, you are placing the tiles out onto the spaces which are available on the hexagon-shaped board, which has a whole bunch of little circles in rows. Everybody is going to be scoring from their own perspective, so what is useful to me may not be useful to the player to my left or right, but it is all about where you place your tiles out on the board, because that's all you're doing in this game is placing tiles out on the board, and you are going to score them based on the birds that are surrounding the tile when you immediately place it and the number of flowers of the same type that are in each of the rows from your perspective at the end of the game. So you are definitely trying to get yourself in a a lot of points when you are placing out your tiles, but you also want to make sure that you're not giving even more points to one of the other players. And that push and pull in the scoring is what makes this game absolutely phenomenal. And the fact that you need to consider scoring from each of the other players' perspectives and that they are physically different perspectives. It's not just like you have a different power so I need to think about how you're going to score things. It's like, no, you're Mm -hmm. literally sitting on the other side of the table. So I'm going to look down at this board and see how you're going to score based on where you're sitting. It's really good and it's just really nice and clean and I love it and I wish we had more opportunities with three people to play this game. Yeah. I love it and I wish more people would talk about it. People don't talk about this game. Everybody, talk about Seikatsu. Talk about Seikatsu. It's great. Talk about Seikatsu amongst yourself, students. I mean, just or, people I mean, who are not here. Yeah, talk, just talk it. Just talk it. Seikatsu, <laughs> IDW. All right, my final game on my six pack is Imhotep from Cosmos Games, designed by Phil Walker Harding. If you listen to our Imhotep of the Duel episode yesterday, yesterday <laughs> last episode, oh boy, um, then you probably have an understanding of why this is here. When we first played Imhotep, I remember we were at the game store, we were kind of sitting around, we had finished what we were playing, and I looked around on the shelves and I saw Imhotep on the game library, and I looked up and like. 
yeah, okay, people have been talking about this. I remember clearly sitting down at like 8.30, we usually left between 9 and 10, and picking it, opening it up, opening up the rule book, I'm like, all right, let's learn this thing real quick. And we were done at 8.55, and if I could pull this game out off a shelf and teach it to four people nobody had played it i hadn't played it and we were done in 25 minutes and we had a blast this is the absolute de definition of a sessionable game uh, Imhotep has very simple decisions. You choose to put a stone on a boat, and then if you have a boat that looks like it's ready to go, you can say, F your boat. We're shipping this boat out right now, and you send it to one of the different locations in the other side of the board there, and you unload the stones, and you feel either very good about the decisions you've made, or you feel very dumb about where you put that stone because you didn't want to put a stone on the obelisk, or you didn't need to go in the burial chamber in that position, but you did it, and somebody else did it to you, and that's the fun of Imhotep. It is a game that plays fast, is super easy to understand. Um, after one or two games, you start to really feel the strategy for the different scoring locations. And then when you get bored of that, you just flip the tiles over and you've got a whole new set of ideas. And then you get the expansion, you've got a whole new set of different scoring options. Uh, Amotep, super fast, super accessible, super easy to teach, and probably one of the most fun per minute um, middleweight games that I've ever played. I think it's fantastic, and I think it's the absolute definition of a sessionable game. Definitely. this We had talked about this when we were looking at this list, and we were like, oh, is Imhotep the Duel something you can get done in half an hour? Yeah. And I think the answer to that is maybe. Yeah. It depends on how everybody is thinking about that central grid. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I was like, but the base game definitely is. And I'm glad to see that's the one that ended up on this list, because while the Duel is a really good game... I think the fact that Imhotep, the base game, can play more players and has that expansion already that has options to it, mm -hmm. the fact that you can have this quick game that seats a bunch of people and is just, like, raucous fun is, is a great thing to put on a list like this. Yeah. Well, there it is. Imhotep. Danielle, what you got for the last one on your six-pack? The last one is going to be that other rando writer that I talked about, and that mm. is Harvest Dice from Gray Fox Games. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, it might be Social Sloth by this point. <laughs> um, I know they were moving it to that line, because it is a more family-weight game than the normal Gray Fox Games stuff. It's not quite Creatures and Cupcakes, if you're familiar with the Social Sloth line, but it is a really good roll-and-write game, and this one is an actual roll-and-write, not a flip-and-fill. In this game, you are going to be rolling three colors of dice. You've got orange to represent your carrots, you've got red to represent your tomatoes, and you've got green to represent your lettuce. They are just regular D6s, and you're going to roll them, and you are going to take turns drafting dice out of the central pool. Whatever color the die that you take is, is the vegetable that you're going to draw into your own personal garden, and whatever the number that is on the die that you take is the row that you're going to have to put it in. There are obviously six rows and each row has three spaces in it. The real caveat here is that once you start drawing lettuce, all the rest of your lettuce has to touch your, the existing lettuce. So if I put it in six, I probably am not going to be able to use a one of lettuce at any point in the rest of this game, unless I fill my entire garden with lettuce. <laughs> The same obviously applies to the tomatoes and carrots. You're going to keep drafting dice until there is one left, and that die is going to determine which vegetable goes up in value at the end of the round. So put, planting a bunch of lettuce into your garden, if nobody ever leaves lettuce at the end of the round, means you're not going to get any points for it, and you just wasted a bunch of time. Now, that's not entirely true, because you will get points for completing rows in your garden, and for having the most of each of the vegetables, and if you take a die that you cannot place into your garden, you feed it to the pig. Pig points! And you get pig points. The pig, pig points, points can be used to adjust the dice that you take, either in number or to count them as a different color, and you're going to get points for having a lot of pig points at the end of the game, and also for having completed rows of six of each of those. So you're trying to trying to maximize your scoring of what you're t taking as opposed to what you're leaving. It is, again, a really simple game, one that I have played with people of all ages. I've definitely played this with kids. I've played it with gamers who have been gaming for 40 years. It's a fun game, and everybody likes the little wooden pig meeple, and you have a fun time saying piggy points, but it does have a nice, like, it has a game there, mm -hmm. as opposed to some some that are just like, oh, I put the numbers. This is It's, it's a fun thematic, but quality game. I really like Harvest Dice. I know it is one that has been perpetually in our bag. Yeah. And not only when I pack the bag. <laughs> uh, so I would love for people to play that when they have half an hour or less. Cool. 
All right. Well, dear listeners out there, if you have any other sessionable games that you think are worthy of being on that list, we would love to hear them. You can definitely hit us up on Board Game Geek. It's guild number 2470. Or you can jump into our Slack channel or send us an internet message at the places we talked about in the beginning. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Draft Mechanic. That is the way to do it. All right. It is time for a quick break, and we will come back with our final segments. Danielle's got her beer segment. We've got the final round. We're going to wrap this one up in a nice little bow for you. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. So in their most recent member survey, the Brewers Association, which is one of the premier trade associations for the craft brewing industry, has included for the first time statistics on members' employee diversity across both race and gender. And I think it was important to talk about because even though as a non-member of the Brewers Association, because we at Draft Mechanic do not own a craft brewery, (laughs) that is a bit of an investment that we are not qualified or able to make. We have a Um, cat brewery. No. Yeah? (laughs) Um... We do not get access to the full report, which in and of itself I have a few problems with. If you're going to have a a survey that you are going to be drawing your incentives from, that you should probably release that information, but they want people to join their association, and it is a trade association. So they do, however, they have released some of the information, and I wanted to talk about it because it's important to get that information out there, and it sort of goes in line with why they asked these questions in the first place, which is that if you don't know where you're starting, you can't accurately try to improve. I mean, there are obviously some things that breweries can always do to increase their diversity in not only their employees, but also their patrons, you know, appealing to more groups in the surrounding areas is always going to be a good thing. And I'll talk about a couple of options at the end of the the segment. But I did want to talk about some of the findings from this member survey. Obviously, this is a self-reporting survey, so it is unlikely that people are going to like if if they don't want to answer it they don't have to answer it but at the same time the numbers that are coming out of this it doesn't look like a lot of people were like oh we don't have diverse breweries we're not going to answer these questions because the numbers are not great so let's talk about gender first when you talk about brewery ownership the the way they actually reported this was a little confusing to me at first but if you look at brewery ownership 54% of breweries are only owned by one gender. Now, that can be either gender, but 54% of them are owned by a single gender. It could be one person or it could be multiple people who are both the same gender. 31% are owned by a 50-50 ownership mix, and 15% are some other mixed split of genders, generally people who have a lot of investors. That being said, in the single gender brewery, 96% of those single gender owners are male. When you look at brewing staff, 7.5% of breweries report having a female in a brewer role, which is a production role specifically. That breakdown gets a little bit more favorable when you look at non-production, non-service staff with 37% of the non-production, non-service staff being female. And when you get to servers, 54% of brewery service staff are female, which, I mean, servers, you think of having a more equal breakdown of genders. This actually slightly favors women, but, I mean, that may have to do with the breakdown of the service industry. Moving beyond gender, when we talk about race, 88% of the people who own craft breweries are white, while Native people make up 4% of brewery owners, that's people who call, classify themselves as American Indian or Alaska Native, there are 2% of breweries that are owned by Asian or Hispanic owners, and 1% of breweries have black owners. When you look at staff who are in non-brewing roles, I don't know why there's not a breakdown on the ethnicity of people who are in brewing roles, but that was not provided in any of the information I could find beyond, obviously, if we were members of the the Brewers Association, you have 7% of non-brewing production staff um, being of Hispanic descent and 3.5% black employees. And if you look at service staff, the percentage of Hispanic employees is still about the same. It's 7.5%, while black employees make up 4% of service staff in breweries. So obviously this, this is not this is not an ideal breakdown. And even the 
representative of the Brewers Association who is commenting on these is saying, we are putting in these benchmarking questions because we have to know where we are starting in order to make change. Some of the things that they have started to implement is that they have, in 2017, they have created the Brewers Association Diversity Committee to identify and address resources and foster a more inclusive culture in the craft beer community. They have hired a diversity ambassador in 2017 as well. They have been creating a grant program, which I believe we talked about last year in 2018, yeah. and have started to announce, re- they've actually announced the recipients of the first round of that that grant program. That being said, obviously these numbers are current numbers, and 2017 was two years ago, which means that we need to find a way to do more. The Not only are the employees and owners of craft brewers, but the patrons of craft brewers are just compared to not only the overall U.S. population, but the U.S. population in the areas that the breweries are, they are overwhelmingly white and male. So it's not just saying, oh, they're, we're, these breweries are representing the population that they're in. They're not compared to the general population, but also their local populations. They're not reaching all of the groups that they could, and they're not creating a space where people are, I don't know if it is a, it is probably at least partially financial, at least partially the way that they are marketing themselves, whatever it is that we need to be making an effort in the craft beer community to be able to make these numbers something that are absolutely less embarrassing. Because right at, at this point, that is an embarrassing representation of the way that your business is serving the population. And I will say that in no uncertain terms. Some of the ways that the suggestions were to increase the the way that these breweries are reaching out, is, and some of them are self-serving, because if you serve a more diverse population, if you serve more of your own community, that's going to be better for your bottom line, obviously, because that's how business works. But also, if they have hired a more diverse staff of employees, that's going to make people feel more like they belong and more comfortable. And that that's only beneficial to everybody involved. I feel like that is a step that needs to be taken. There has been a suggestion made to make sure that not only employees, but also owners are aware of the biases that they personally have and of the industry in general so that they can note those. Because if you don't know what your biases are, you're never going to be able to overlook them. You're just going to assume they're not there. So now hopefully with this information being out there, we can all be like, oh, this is an area that needs to be worked on in craft beer. And moving forward, we need to make sure that we're getting the best employees, not just the most white male employees going forward. So I wanted to talk about that because it had just recently been released in whatever state of release it currently is. I mean, it's still largely gated by a Brewers Association membership, but I wanted to put it out there because it's something that we need to be aware of in the craft beer community to move forward and make sure it is an inclusive space for everybody, which really we should be doing with all hobbies. You need to make inclusive spaces for everyone because it's just better for everyone that way. Here, here. I so that's agree. our beer segment. It got preachy at the end, but you know what? It's important. <laughs> yeah, it is very important stuff, and I'm glad that you took the time to get that information together and talk about it. I will be linking to, obviously, because that was a bunch of numbers I just said at you, so I will definitely be linking to all that information. Cool. I highly encourage everybody to go check that information out so you can be net educated about where we are as a community. Let's get to that final round. Let's- all right. So rolling into the final round, I talked about this at the end of last episode. And just to give you a refresher on the topic, uh, my topic was how do you deal with board game burnout? Do you need to go back to an old standby, try something new, or just take a break altogether? I've been honestly suffering a good bit of board game burnout recently. I think it just comes from, you know, we're finishing up our fourth year of the podcast, actually. Not this episode, but next episode will be our fourth anniversary episode, I guess, which is impressive. Um, But, you know, I'm getting to that point where the travel and all the other stuff and just kind of getting burned out on doing some of the same stuff again and again, I just wanted to ask this question to everybody and see how they're feeling um, and how they deal with getting burned out on something. So we got a lot of really good information from our Slack. Uh, If you want to join in, draftmechanic.net slash Slack, it's free to join. You can come and join in with us and talk about board games, craft beer, and anything along those lines and outside of those lines as well. So I'll start it off with Stewie, one of our friends down in Australia. He says, I think taking a break is best. I got burnt out doing Pandemic Legacy with friends that once we finished it, we stopped for a few weeks. 
It's hard for my friends to catch up because of toddlers, so one game can take hours due to kids. Thankfully, people understand, but the games being played now are so very few between that it is unlikely I will get burnt out anytime soon. Can I get burnt out asking people to play a game with me? I can definitely yeah. see how. <laughs> After enough times of asking people to join you for games, you just kind of like, well, I'm tired of trying, and just we're going to take a break for a minute. At the same time, people do need to care for their toddlers. Yes, do please care for your toddlers. <laughs> Paul Imboden says, it's a hobby. I control it, not the other way around. When I burn out, I focus on something else, like dancing or exercising or spending more time with my nephew. The drive to play games always comes back eventually. And if it doesn't, well, then that's a sign to keep stopping. Yeah. I I like that the first thing that he says he focuses on is dancing. That's exciting to me. It's fabulous. And new and exciting information about Paul Imboden. But yeah, I mean, he's right. It is a hobby. And obviously... There are some folks in the gaming industry who work in the gaming industry who need to keep playing games and they don't have that luxury, but I feel like that's the way with any job. We have the luxury that you can take a little bit of a rest. I mean, we still have to have some good content for you, which yeah. I hope you think we do, yeah. but it is it is good to be aware of the fact that your hobby should not control you. <laughs> All right, moving on to Mr. Dr. BJ from Board Game Gumbo. He has to say, I haven't got burned out on gaming, but I do get burned out on types of games. So naturally, I switch. I get away from Euros to play something I'm not necessarily a fan of, or I play some two-player games or some card games. Get someone to teach me something brand new that I've never heard of. Keep it fresh and fun. Can we talk about that sick burn on non-Euro games? What do you mean? I get away from Euros to play something I'm not really a fan of. (laughs) Fair, fair. Ah, uh, good old BJ. No, he he makes a point. I mean, even if you're burnt out on a specific type of game, maybe playing something completely different is going to give you a fresh perspective. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what you need to do. I don't know if I think I need to counter my burnout by learning a big heavy euro that we haven't been playing for a little bit, but have I'll you, give it a go. Have you tried dancing? Uh, not yet. Jeff says, since starting into this hobby, I've only suffered one lull. I found myself standing in front of my game shelf looking at each game with none of them jumping out at me. So I tried setting up different games on the table and that didn't work. So then I just went and watched Netflix. (laughs) I think the last couple of months I finally got out of it by buying a new game. (laughs) Which I mean, when you buy something, if you're not you, you're usually pretty excited about it, right? Yeah, very true. So that should give you a little bit of a little bit of a bump to be like, oh, I want to play this game. But I think there's also something to be said for taking it out of the box. He said it didn't work for him, but if if you are feeling like, eh, maybe I don't want to play a game, maybe just taking it out of the box, seeing if setting it up on the table gives you a little bit of energy, you know, get, mm-hmm. getting yourself to fake it till you make it, I guess. <laughs> All right. Up next, Will Foy has these words for us. Perhaps I'm unique on this, but I don't seem to burn out on tabletop. Two reasons. One. I'm a remote worker, so playing with others satisfies my extrovert's need to interact with people as a mental health energy source. Two, I play so many new-to-me things and old familiars either from my own collection or from others' collections or prototype at playtest events like the awesome Break My Game, Unpub, etc., that I seem to not go stale. I think if I did, I'd look to other interests, including my family or concerts, I'm a contributor to the live music archive over at archive.org, or areas of political activism that I doubt I'll hit this. Hey, remember to register to vote and then do so, y'all. Yeah, Will is uh, is a good dude when it comes to political activism. And uh, if you're listening to this when it comes out and you live in North Carolina, vote tomorrow. Yeah. So that is something that is always worth your time. But again, going back to just go to other hobbies. But he also is talking about playing a bunch of new stuff all the time, mm-hmm. which honestly, I think that might be some of what burns you and yeah. I both out. I'm tired of reading rule books sometimes. Yeah, there is that. But at the same time, it's really fun. Like when you hit on something, when I read the Calico rule book, mm-hmm. I got really excited about it because I'm like, oh, I understand why this is cool and I'm excited about it. And I get to show all the people that I play games with how to play this thing that I'm excited about. Yeah. So while it is difficult to like read rule books all the time, it also can be really fun when you find that thing that's just like, oh, cool, I get to share this with all the people that I know. Mm-hmm. Las Vegas Royale. Mm. Fiona from The Game Shelf says, as a reviewer, it's hard to take care of your burnout. We try and recharge every so often with a weekend of older games, which tends to help a lot. I also find it's fun to get your gaming energy from others. Watching a non-gaming friend or colleague enjoy games is a great recharge, too. 
I guess we never really break from gaming. We just try to game in different ways with people to mix things up. Yeah. I like that thought of watching other people enjoy gaming for the first time or, you know, getting into gaming new. That is something that's always been really pleasant about game nights is every now and then we'll get some new people in there. And I'll get a little bit of a bump off of seeing somebody get, you know, really excited like, oh, board games do this now? This is awesome. Yeah, that is, I don't know, I feel like that's kind of a risk that I'm not always willing to take. (laughs) Because watching somebody who you think is going to absolutely love a game be like, yeah, that was fine can be more of a suck than I get a bump from watching somebody have a really great time with a game. Yeah. But it is like, it is a good way if that works for you, seeing somebody just have a really awesome time with something that you care deeply about in any hobby, I feel like is a good thing. Mm -hmm. All right. And as is tradition, the final word of the final round comes from Patrick Hillier. Patrick says, all of my hobbies ebb and flow with peaks and valleys of interest. I have other hobbies than board gaming, so when I get bored, no pun intended for once, I can switch over to the latest cooking method I saw on TV or binge-watching some series somebody mentioned. Eventually, I'll hear about a board game that piques my interest, new or old, and I'll say, hey, I've not played that in a while, and get back to the table. Just let him, just let, let that kind of exist in there. Patrick with his wise words. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Do you have words to say? Yeah, I had a bunch to talk about that. Say. Uh, Patrick is absolutely great with his cooking methods, that is for sure. If you if you <laughs> follow him on Instagram, you will see many a sous vide meat. But I also think that his example of what to do with burnout is the one I've been currently using. I, I joked about it on the last episode to say that, you know, when I got bored of something, I played eight hours of Fire Emblem, mm-hmm. which is not an exaggeration. I wish it was. Now you're 150 hours in. I'm not. But, um... <laughs> It is certainly what I'm doing right now. Like, we obviously still play board games. We have board game meetups, but we don't play them two player at home as much as we generally would have. You've been traveling and you've been also feeling a little bit burnt out, I know. Yeah. But I've also, like, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, I need a second to step away from this sometimes. I'm going to play this video game. Ironically, it's like the most board game video game (laughs) ever. It's literally just looking at numbers and trying to plan your optimal move. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely still a board game, but maybe it's Maybe that's it. Maybe it's a change of perspective on it. I feel like we're also spending a good bit more time with our D&D campaign right now, which is something that obviously... (laughs) He says we've met twice. We we did skip over the last, you know, two months or so because of travel, but like we've got a a session this Thursday as well. Mm -hmm. And that's something that when we were in the swing of it before all the travel mess, and then again right now, I feel like we're going to be putting this back into a lot of our weeknights. And it's a different kind of gaming, but it still fills that gaming itch. So it's taken up a, a board game night. And that's fine because I really want to continue to tell more fun stories. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I mean, you finally figured out why everybody is very excited about RPGs. Yay. Well, I mean, it wasn't for a lack of wanting. It was just a lack of time. And All right. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of lack of time, we are past the hour 30 minute mark, so it is time for us to end this particular episode of Draft Mechanic. Thank you all so much yet again for joining us here today. We really appreciate it. And coming to the end of year four and just like the community we've had, the friends we've made along the way and all the other goofy sentences people always say it's really meant a lot to us so thank you so much for tuning in all these episodes and all these years uh if you are inclined please tell your friends about draft mechanic because that's kind of how we get the word out about the show you can always send them to draftmechanic.net or boardgames.beer which is an actual real website that i have purchased and you can go to on the internet you can find us on the internet on your favorite social medias of twitter instagram and facebook at at draft mechanic feel free to share that to your friends as well so they know how to find us and i guess you could send us an email as well draftmechanic at gmail.com is a real email address that does work we also have a board game guild that is guild number 2470 so you can chime in the thread over there we have local game nights our next one is going to be on september 17th which is a tuesday at salute cerveceria so we would love for you to come out Mm-hmm. And Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games cleverly crafted. Don't forget to check out After the Empire. It is on Kickstarter right now. And I dig it. It's a good game. <laughs> all right. Well, um, no, that's all I got. you have any other magic words to end out season four? As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that we'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. Sounds like a plan. Let's do that. Good night. Night. Draft Mechanic episode 109 was recorded on Monday, September 9th, 2019 in front of a live studio cat. Please in your eyes, you are the beholder. You 
Render me stricken Do not go gently Into that good line Hey, this is Patrick And this is Eric From Patrick, Patrick and, and Eric, Eric in the Morning Join us every now and again for about a half an hour as we freeform chat about whatever's on our minds and how it all relates back to our favorite hobby, board gaming. Patrick and Eric in the Morning can be found on the What Did You Play This Week podcast feed and on the Punchboard Media site. Happy listening! Punchboard Media, where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com.